Was hat dieser Zuckerrübensirup mit meiner nächsten Buchvorstellung zu tun? Let's find out! So today I want to do another book review and the book I've chosen uh, is this one uh, Anton Zischka Wissenschaft bricht Monopole, or in English, Science breaks Monopolies. I have to see if this works out here because uh, there are quite a lot of mosquitoes here. I hope they don't get too annoying. Um, I have to review this book because I have to give it back to the library. Yes, I actually got it from the library. People still do that. You can still get interesting uh, books from the library. So, um, as far as I know, Anton Zischka was like a um, popular writer uh, in the 1930s and 40s in Germany. He wrote books about uh, global economy, about science, but in a more accessible way for the public. So not too scientific, but also not too um, generalizing. So um, he wrote, for example, books like, um, like the global oil economy and how um, the power structure in the West depends on it. Um, and in this book, Science Breaks Monopolies, he describes how Europe, and especially Germany, has been dependent on trade in, throughout the 19th century, the 18th and 19th century, and how the um, like big um, landlords and big trade cartels dominated the trade and made Europe dependent on their raw materials. Um, just as an example, uh, in the 19th century Europe was lacking um, fertilizers for their soil, for their ag agriculture and uh, um, for a long time they imported guano like um, I think it's some kind of bat shit or like bird shit from the coast of um, Chile and it actually used to be a very important resource um, it had accumulated over hundreds and thousands of years and it uh, was a good fertilizer for the soil and this is why it was exported and then there was also um, some other don't remember quite well some kind of sodium or natrium that they exported from Chile as well um, and from Bolivia to Europe um, for the um, fertilizing industry and um, one of the biggest examples in the beginning of this book how the science helped to break these monopolies is for example the synthesize how do you call it uh, the synthetic creation of um, nitrogen because uh, when they discovered the soil properties and they researched you know what kind of nutrients the plants need to grow uh, what kind of chemicals they discovered that um, nitrogen was very important and they basically learned how to create nitrium literally out of thin air so German scientists um, yeah figured out how to create how to draw the nitro nitrogen out of the atmosphere and you know crystallize it and make it into a substance that you can sow in your field to increase the fertility of the um, of the plantation and um, the reason why I used the beet sugar syrup in the beginning is because this is another big example from this book that throughout the 19th century Europe was dependent on importing sugar from the, the, the West Indies, you know, the Americas like Cuba and Brazil and all these places and they had huge monopolies on the sugar and they became insanely rich, you know, like the, the big sugar barons of Havana they basically could uh, turn up and down the prices of sugar uh, as they wished because um, at the time there were, were no many other sources of sugar than the, the sugar cane from the Americas. 
And since the European market became dependent on sugar, um, yeah, they had a lot of power and they made a lot of money. And Germany, the German economy was losing a lot of money um, because they had to import the sugar. Now, from the modern perspective, it can be argued, you know, what do you need sugar for? You know, it's not very healthy and um, it's not very nutritious in the end. Uh, why do you need it? Uh, but apparently back then they kind of needed it, the economy depended on it. They also made alcohol from it, which is used for various purposes. And so they, they tried to find ways to also synthesize it. And they uh, basically invented the, the sugar beet, like a root that can be um, planted and then, you know, harvested and turned into sugar. And the, the sugar beet was known before in Europe but through science and selection and um, you know biology and breeding they basically increased the, the amount of sugar in the plant so it was worthwhile extracting it and making the syrup you know before the amount of sugar was lower and they both um, improved the, the, the process of extraction but also the sugar content of the plant and so basically the, the beet sugar syrup uh, the sugar beet syrup is an, is an invention uh, basically a man-made product it's an invention of um, agriculture and science um, now I found this very interesting to read that because since childhood I have uh, always liked to, to eat um, sugar beet syrup uh, I find it very tasty and I, I eat it sometimes uh, in the morning with a lot of uh, butter and on a piece of bread. Now, um, the most prominent example in this book about how Europe was dependent on monopolies, and how these monopolies were broken by science and um, which then led to more independence of, of the countries basically and more independence from global trade cartels the biggest and most interesting example and there are many examples of different resources that were synthesized by European scientists especially by German scientists and the most prominent example is actually fuel you know oil because in the beginning of the 20th century um, German scientists managed to actually synthesize fuel to create fuel from coal, you know, liquid fuel from brown coal and also from, um, you know, the stone coal. Um, and this is very remarkable. I think um, already in the First World War they had the first processes, but they were not really, you know, ripe for industrial use yet. But then in the 20s they uh, increased the efficiency of the process and it's called, uh, I think, the, the Fischer... Um, so there, there were various... Uh, there, I think there were two different processes invented by, by German scientists to create fuel and later also rubber from brown coal and from, uh, you know, from surface mined coal. And this is extremely interesting for me because um, the fuel created from coal was called Leuna benzene. And this is because the biggest plant or the most modern uh, and most prominent facility to create this, this fuel was in Leuna, which is quite close to Leipzig and Halle and uh, was a very, um, yeah, very, what do you call it, a very significant part of my childhood because in Halle where I grew up, what was always famous was the chemical industry and especially Leuna and Buna. Leuna and Buna were these two gigantic plants that uh, spewed out all this uh, pollution and that polluted the rivers, you know, the, the socialist government in Germany back then, they were not very, um, you know, they were not taking care of the environment so much, so the, 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 the Saale River where I grew up was basically always polluted from these chemical plants, but I never really knew what exactly they were creating there. Now, the Buna plant is actually called after the substance Buna, which is synthetic rubber um, created from coal. And Loina is just uh, the village nearby the, the synthetic fuel plant. And what I also learned from this book or from other research I did on the internet was that by 1943, um, Germany was producing 50% of its own fuel just from synthetic fuel from coal 
and I think I, I thought this was this was absolutely astonishing. Um, then, starting in 1943, the Leuna. Uh, chemical plant was bombarded almost weekly by American and British bombers and uh, many people died but it was always you know rebuilt and they put a lot of effort in, in keeping the production up because of, of course you know fuel was absolutely vital for the, the German military in the Second World War and especially for the kind of warfare that were they were they were conducting you know they had this tactics of blitzkrieg of fast movements of motorized infantry and tanks and also aircraft and you know for mobility you needed uh, one you needed fuel and second you needed rubber and with these um, processes that they had invented they could synthesize rubber and fuel and be completely independent from you know the British Empire and the global trade cartels and all this stuff and I even um, read somewhere that in Auschwitz in a famous place like Auschwitz there was actually a Buna plant, there was a gigantic chemical plant um, synthesizing Buna, like synthetic rubber, from coal. Um, you know, which made it uh, very important for the armaments industry and for the German war effort. Now, um, yeah, I was... <clears throat> Man, these, these mosquitoes are really annoying. So, um, what I was thinking about when I was, you know, reading this book and reading about Buna and Leuna and synthetic fuel and rubber was that most of the modern wars that I, you know, experienced in the media during my life so far, most of these wars in the Middle East, you know, uh, against Gaddafi and against Saddam Hussein and against, uh, you know, recently in Syria, most of these wars have something to do with oil and with the global you know, with the petrodollar, with global trade cartels and with the global monopolies on oil and the, the raw materials. And the, the thing that there's some evil dictator suppressing his own people is mostly, a, at least in modern times, um, just a pretext, you know, for bombing the country and getting control over the oil resources. I heard that in, in, a, in, um, in Iraq, <coughs> I heard that, I don't know if it's true, but I heard that Saddam Hussein was actually trying to sell his oil in Euro instead of dollars, which would have been quite a big blow for the American currency because they have a lot of debt and if the people are not forced to use dollars anymore because they can buy and sell their raw materials also in Euro or other currencies, then the Americans or the global dollar-based trade system is basically in big trouble. Uh, another example was Gaddafi. I heard that he was bombed because he wanted to sell his oil only in gold and this is another example you know how the dollar based global petrol industry and petrol trade would have been threatened by such a measure. Um, well you could argue now as well that uh, Hitler Germany was also bombed uh, maybe in part I wouldn't say in total but I think in part it's possible that Germany was also destroyed um, because they had this um, this industry of, of making synthetic coal because you can basically find coal almost everywhere in the world and uh, it's it's you know there's plenty of coal and it would have made all the countries who don't have access to petrol uh, much more independent and would have meant a lot of um, uh, you know much less profit for the big oil uh, cartels on this world. So this is why I found this particular example um, quite interesting. But what is also interesting in general about this book Science Breaks Monopolies is that it um, just gives you a whole overview over the chemical industry and what it actually meant in the, in the 19th and 20th century and why it was pushed and pursued so much. I mean. Uh, there's, there's much more than just uh, fuel and sugar and fertilizers, there's also syn synthetic clothing and you could argue that this person describes everything in a quite um, glamorous way, so he's a big technocrat, you could say, he loves the technology and he also remarks that it is, it is kind of dangerous to go into this route of synthesizing everything and it could be, you know, harmful to the health and to the global you know 
economy or whatever. He also says it's kind of a, a scary thing, but he puts a lot of hopes into the technological revolution and into the synthetic uh, industry. For example, he praises um, butter, you know, margarine made from cotton, from cotton seeds. And he says, you know, this is how all the poor people who hitherto could not eat their bread with butter but had to eat it dry, now they can use butter. Well, uh, recently, while um, researching a little bit about, you know, veganism and the plant-based diets, I uh, heard that actually plant oils are not really healthy and that they can actually cause a lot of harm to your um, to your metabolism uh, when you use them excessively. So I think, at least in this case, you know, synthetic butter, so to say, is not really an alternative to real butter. And yeah, he goes into the this, this, this subject that it might be harmful to synthesize everything, but in general, he's a great proponent, a big proponent and a big, uh, you know, he's in favor of uh, more science and of basically creating a better world through science. Um, I'm not quite, uh, you know, on, on the same level. I'm more a proponent, proponent of natural materials, you know, natural leather, natural wool. And I could make a whole other video about the topic, you know, how natural materials have so many, so many benefits over synthetic materials. But in general, it's a very, very interesting book. And I, I can walk now through the city of Leipzig, for example, with different eyes, because I can see all these um, different street names that are sometimes named after famous chemists and famous physicists, uh, you know, who invented all these um, processes and, and to improve them and now I know oh yeah uh, Walter Nernst or like uh, Justus Liebig ah yeah that was the guy who was involved in the um, uh, you know synthetic creation of, of nitrogen for example and uh, all these things so, so it kind of opens your eyes a little bit and teaches you a little more detail about um, the world you live in so I can recommend you this book I don't know if you can find it in English it's called Wissenschaft bricht Monopole by Anton Zischka. I uh, hope you enjoy the review and see you next time.